I was raised by a professor of social work and an administrator of student activities in the 1970s at what was in essence, not formally, but in essence, a community college devoted to uplift of primarily black students of humble background in Philadelphia. I was minted in that. That would surprise many people today, but that was how I was raised. And I was raised listening to certain terms. I was raised thinking of activism as constituting a certain complex of attitudes. There was something called career ladders. I remember my parents mentioning career ladders a lot. Career ladders made no sense to me when I was seven, but the idea I found out later was that there had been a massive civil rights revolution in the 1960s, and the idea was to teach people who had been dealt a bad hand how to take advantage of the new opportunities that opened up so quickly in the 1970s. That was career ladders, and there was a revision, because I know that in the late 70s, my mother started saying new career ladders, and she was very devoted to that program. It still exists. It's called something else. My mother would talk about something called Hibsi, and I never knew what that was until later in my life. She talked about that into the 90s. Hibsi was human, um, human behavior in the social environment, and the idea, once again, was to examine what makes people make the choices that they do and what might distract people from making choices that they might make that aren't the best ones, that aren't their fault. It was a very interesting field, Hibsi. I was immersed in this. This is what I thought activism was. Lately, we have a whole new sense of what, as it were, the way it's often said in America, black people need to do now. Now, there's a new idea that the important thing to do is not to help people take advantage of opportunities that have opened up, but to obsessively try to identify racism in people's souls to identify how racism in some form might be responsible for inequities between white and black people in society, and to try to solve those problems via brute, set-aside kinds of policies where people are just dragged into positions in order to create a certain kind of headcount, and also an idea that people who aren't on board with this program, which has been called anti-racism, especially since the tumult of 2020, need to have their lives destroyed for not being with said program. All of this is the new anti-racist platform. And it's thought, tacitly, to be an advance over things like new career ladders and Hibsi. But it isn't. And like most things that are complicated, all of this has come in quickly in a way, but gradually. One thing has happened after another. It's easy as you're tending to your life in general to think that a lot of people have just gone crazy. But no, nobody has gone crazy, but we've taken a grievous detour in anything that will be worth the name anti-racism at any point since 1619. The tragedies in all of this are endless, and so, for example, this anti-racism that we see is carried out in serene disregard of what its actual consequences are for people who need help. Serene disregard for any connection to the anti-racism that my parents would have recognized. And so, random example, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, a very progressive, socially committed, but unfortunately white curator, mentions in a discussion that it's very important after April of 2020 to widen the purview of the curators to art by people who are not white, but that he didn't want to absolutely ignore art by people who were white because that would constitute reverse discrimination. For using that term, and there was no build up to this, no one had any problem with Gary Garrels. For using that term one time in one discussion, that august steward of the modern art curatorial world, was fired, he does not have a job now. Now, what purpose did that serve? A lot of people felt really good about destroying that man's career, but it didn't help anybody eat, it didn't teach anybody how to get a job, it did nothing for the problems that black people have in San Francisco, literally yards from where he was fired. That kind of thing happens too much. 
So there's that lack of connection related to that. There is a general incoherency about the way these sorts of things are argued. And so, for example, what do we call racism? What is, what is racism? So if there's any kind of inequity between white and black people, then it must be due to racism under perhaps some extended definition. So minor example. In the United States, quite tragically, every summer, you can be pretty sure that in certain large cities, such as Philadelphia, Chicago, Washington, certainly New York City, where I live, Dozens and maybe hundreds of black boys will die in turf wars over not much at all. And what you're not supposed to say is that the number of white boys who die this way is infinitesimal. The number of Asians who die that way is a negative number. And <laughs> the number of Latinos who die that way, and this is especially uncomfortable, is much, much less than the black boys. There's no blame to be put on the black boys. Obviously, this is a tragic an urgent problem. However, to say that the reason for all of that is racism, whether you're talking about face-to-face -face racism or a torturous definition of structural racism, the definition makes no sense. It's so abstract. It's so, I hope this isn't too American an expression, and as a matter of fact, I'll change it. It's too mousetrap a conception to really speak to intelligent members of the public. It's not about racism. It's about the complexities of social history. Yet, that kind of incoherence is let pass. Or, we have an entire way of looking at things that is based on feelings. Feelings are supposed to be what you go for. Now, part of the enlightenment, part of what you teach your children, is that you can't always trust your feelings. That's called basic maturity. But there's a tenet of this new anti-racism which says that how someone feels must trump what the intent was and whether or not the whole thing was even important. Random example, University of Southern California, August 2020. Uh, an unfortunately white man is teaching a course about communication and he's talking about how in real life people have marks of hesitation. In English, that mark of hesitation tends to be you know or like. In Mandarin Chinese, that mark of hesitation tends to be, I hear this every day in my neighborhood, nega, 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 it means that, 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 that. Now, of course, it sounds like something else, but it isn't because it's in Chinese. <laughs> so, this professor said exactly what I just said. And in this case, I am criticizing the black people in question, not the black boys in the turf wars, that's too complicated, but black <laughs> students in the spring actually got that man fired from the course for the spring because they felt hurt that he had actually said that word over and over because it was hard enough to be black. Now, that, frankly, is about feelings, and any mature response to them, i.e. what the response to them would have been before roughly March 2020, would have been, folks, racism does exist, but that was not it. Get over it and go do your work but no one told them that because feelings is supposed to trump everything. And then the hardest thing, and I'm watching this creep in, there's a then they came for me aspect to it where I keep on trying to think things are getting better, but I'm not sure they are, is the lowering of standards that all of this involves. Because the truth is, some people are better at some things than others. History has left it so that some groups overall won't excel as much as other groups at certain things, and the idea is how to get them to do so. But instead, our new idea is that if something is too much of a challenge, or if something happens to go against the new tenets of anti-racism, then it must just be eliminated. And I'm going to say this in public one time because I don't want to bite the hand that feeds me, but I'm still genuinely upset about this. I moonlight teaching a course on the history of Western classical music at Columbia. It's such fun. And there's been this one way that people have done it since the dawn of time. Now, you change things. Nowadays, most people do the two final weeks about jazz. I'm one of them. That's very important because jazz is as complex as classical music. But I had done it for a few years, and I decided to do it again this spring. And there is a whole new syllabus. This is the anti-racist Western classical music syllabus. And there are rather suspicious changes. And so, for example, we're not supposed to teach the kids about Wagner anymore. because apparently, And it isn't because Wagner is, is, has the Jewish issue. It's because they needed to make room for somebody else. 
So we're not going to do Die Walküre. We're not going to talk about Gesamtkunstwerk. You know who we're going to talk about instead? Nina Simone. Now, God bless Nina Simone, great artist. But this is a course about Western classical music. Nina Simone wasn't involved in that. The only reason that she's being put in and knocking out Brahms, Chopin, and Wagner is because two and a half people said so and everyone was afraid of them. That is the problem with all of this. All of these things are happening not because of some general consensus happening across society gradually. This is not Burkean change. This is a reign of terror enforced by a small number of earnest but misguided people. And the reason that they get their way is because of how much progress we've made. Specifically, we in America are a society where the enlightened view is that to be a racist is almost equivalent to being a pedophile. It's the worst thing you can be called that you're actually likely to be. That is an accomplishment. That wasn't true in 1960. That wasn't really true even in 1980. That is a mark of advance in a society that, frankly, most human societies have not made. If people are a little oversensitive about it, that's human nature. The fact is something great has happened. But the negative byproduct is that if someone says, we have to have Nina Simone instead of Brahms, Chopin, or Wagner, then although almost nobody in the room agrees, they will do it because they know that if that person doesn't get their way, they're going to call the music department at Columbia racist on Twitter where the whole world can see it. If it were 20 years ago, there'd be no way to do that. That's why things like this didn't happen 20 years ago. So it's a reign of terror rather than a gradual change in society that perhaps a curmudgeon like me would need to just get on board with gradually. It's an artificial situation. Also, in the fact that it is enforced by social media. That has an awful lot to do with it, and it's even more specific. Of course, we can talk about the creeping in of this quote-unquote anti-racism over the teens, and you can even see rumblings of it in the aughts. But it really goes overboard in the spring of 2020, and we don't talk enough about this yet, but it's for a contingent reason. Anything that happened then happened over Zoom or Slack. We tend to imagine these things happening in rooms because that's normal life and we're mostly back to it. But all those things happened when people were not breathing all over each other and seeing and feeling each other in real rooms. All of those people getting fired for no reason, it was because people were in those little squares. People were having side conversations in Slack. Now we don't exist like that as much anymore, but we have this new pattern. And so it's just this random historical contingency. I'm thinking about, you know, of course it's all about me, here I am in Cambridge, and I don't want to cross the street because the, the cars are on what I think of as <laughs> the wrong side. And of course, I, where I am, you all think that our cars are on the wrong side. I'm sure there's some interesting explanation for that. Somebody told me once, I forget, it had something to do with horses or, or something. But whatever it was, it wasn't about God. There's no reason why we drive on the right and you drive on the left. It just happened to come out that way because of the roll of the dice. And here we are. That's harmless, except when I try to cross the street. But all of this, where the mores of frustrated, bored, and I don't think it was people be especially afraid. It wasn't people afraid of COVID. People were bored and lonely and on Zoom and on Slack and doing really terrible things to each other. And now we're still doing it because it came to seem normal during a really ugly year called 2020. It just, just won't do. Now, this is the problem. One way of looking at this in a cool-headed way is to suppose that what we're faced with is free speech under threat, that there are people who need to be told that it's okay for people to disagree, that we need to be able to disagree more constructively. Now, that's true, but if you think about it, who doesn't know that? The people in question are all quite aware that human beings will disagree. The issue is not teaching people that we need to foster free speech. They don't hear it that way because they're basing their actions and their views and their sense of mission on an idea that battling power differentials, and especially where white power is concerned, has to be absolutely central to human intellectual, artistic, and moral endeavor. That's a windy way of putting it. but. There's no responsible way of putting it in any flintier a way. 
That is what these people are thinking. They don't put it that way. But that means that for them to say, can't you hear a different view when it has to do with, for example, race or also issues of gender, is like saying, can't you think of pedophilia as a different way of being a person? To the extent that few of us would be ready for that, that's how the modern extreme prosecutorial anti-racist feels when you say, can't you open up to other views? They figure there are no other views. And let's face it, we do feel that society advances. No slavery, no pedophilia, women should vote. For them, the idea is that anti-racism of this kind is the new advance. It's the new white meat. That's the idea. And so we can't hope to change this by talking to people like that and saying, open up to new ideas. They won't. And that may sound cynical, but I'm basing it partly on my having experienced these people as an academic for the past 25 years, and then especially over the past three. They're impregnable. They're utterly unreachable. The issue is getting to most of us, all of the rest of us who are having our lives destroyed or affected negatively, or we're watching people having their lives destroyed or interfered with because of the actions of a vocal and frightening minority of people who themselves can't be changed. There's a bravery that's necessary at this point. The only way that we can keep society from being turned upside down by this religion, and that's what it is. If you want to understand it, it's not people who are crazy. It's not people who are seeking power. Most of them are almost proud of the power they don't have. It's a religion. And if you want to keep society from being taken over by this religion, we have to have the bravery to tell people like this no and to endure that there's a certain kind of noise that they're going to make. But if we don't have that bravery, if we don't realize that being called a racist in the public square might not always destroy a life, sometimes, but in many cases, people are just scared. Really, if we don't do it, we're going to lose what we have thought of as an enlightened society because of certain contingent things that happened during a pandemic and a particularly grisly murder of an innocent man. Just because of chance, just because of Zoom, Slack, boredom, habit, and fear. That is not the way a mature society should operate. I was um, on the, the plane, which was actually great, but then the customs line was too long. The way that I always make the customs line move, and this always works, is I get out the Saturday New York Times crossword puzzle, because it's the hard one, and so I get kind of immersed, and I lose myself, and then suddenly the line moves. And so I did that today, and all of a sudden, right up that sack, come on. So, um, going through the puzzle, one of the clues was, um, what is a mensch? And the answer was a stand-up guy. And what I found myself thinking when I put in the answer was mensch tonight. What we need is to be menches. And by that, I mean we need to be, I'm not going to say stand-up guy, but stand-up person. And I like mensch because the idea is not that this is about being a superhero. It isn't that you stand up with your chest poked out and do something heroic and face death. I've sometimes called it Spartacus, but there's a little bit of <laughs> about that that I don't think we need to think of it as. More, it's do the right thing. Standing up to this kind of person, they can't help it, but they need to be standed up to. They need to be made very upset. We need to stop changing our lives based on what they ask for. In the same way as you help your neighbor next door, as you give somebody the extra tomatoes that you grew in your garden, as you tutor somebody in reading after you do your work. Just being the right kind of person, doing the right thing in society. And it doesn't always have to be a huge investment, but this kind of person must be resisted, or we're going to be living in a society that more resembles what we've seen under Stalin and what we've seen under the Cultural Revolution, only minus the physical violence, than I think any of us would want to. We can't be deceived by the fact that it's called something like anti-racism or social justice. I think we all know that what's really going on is a misguided and recreational, self-focused kind of manipulation. It must be stopped. It's not 2020 anymore. And our lives and our society are on the line. I think I've done 20, and so I'm going to stop. Thank you.